Hi there, thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson, and it's good to have your company. This week, Fred and I will be talking about the latest image from the James Webb Space Telescope, and we'll chat about some of those other images that surfaced last week, which has got uh, everybody quite excited, and rightly so. We'll also be looking at a, a new deal that seems to have been struck between the United States and Russia in regard to astronauts and cosmonauts working together on the International Space Station. Given everything that's happening in the world, it's it's refreshing to see that something positive is happening. And the Mars crater that spat at us, spat a rock at us, <laughs> has been identified. We'll talk about that. And we'll be hearing from Mark in Quebec, who has a, a what-if question for us. I love those. And Rusty wants to ask us a question about quasars. That's all to come on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9... Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining us, as always, is the good professor himself, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? I am quite well. Had a lovely weekend. Went down to uh, a place called Bathurst in the gold mm. fields. The first. The first place in the colony that was established outside of Sydney, I think, was Bathurst, wasn't it? Uh, yes, and, I, think, I think that's right. Yeah. Yes. They had their winter festival on, so we went down there and froze and ate ice cream and took the grandchildren down for a little bit of fun and, uh, yeah, they had a good time. Very good. But, um, yes, it's it's a cold part of the world, the tablelands. So yeah, I um, it is. <laughs> don't venture there in winter very often if I can avoid it. Uh, what about you? What's going on in your world? Well, well I was in a place called Canberra. The weekend. Oh, that's even colder. <laughs> yeah. And I'm was. only talking about the people in Parliament. <laughs> oh, I can't comment on that uh, since I work for them. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I, I was down um, the, uh, probably worth a mention, Questacon is the National Science Centre down in Canberra, which I have a lot to do with. Uh, and its long term director, Professor Graham Durant, who's a very able director and science communicator, has retired. So I was down for his retirement party, as it was. It was a valedictory address that was well worth going to. And, um, in fact, it was some fairly important people there, including the Governor-General. He and his Ooh. wife were at the event. So it was, yes, and, uh, you know, a former um, chief scientist and lots of other people, as well as an astronomer at large. But that was Friday night, so on Saturday, Marnie and I uh, had a bit of a stroll around the lake. I took my scooter down because electric scooters are okay in Canberra, not in New South Wales, but they're, they're good. Oh, but yeah. Very pleasant. And yeah, they, uh, they do drive them around in Sydney a lot, and I uh, saw a lot of them in Melbourne earlier this year when I was there. So, yes, they're very controversial too, those things, I must mm. say. Good fun, mm. though. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Now, let's talk about James Webb, the James Webb Space Telescope, which last week released, NASA released the first images, and we saw that, that just amazing image uh, first up, which was a tiny sliver of the universe, but certainly one that was a spectacular image to release first time. But they've released a, a bunch more, and you can see them all on the uh, on the NASA website. And now they've released a, another one of uh, of Jupiter, and that's uh, that that is mind blowingly amazing. That one. It is. It's really interesting because um, so the, the the sequence of events was that the president uh, sort of usurped the first release, so that it was that was done a day earlier than all the others, and that, as you said, was the one we talked about last week, which was that deep image, at the web first deep field, I think is what it was being called, showing. Dis very distant galaxies, some of which were more than 13 billion light years away. Quite extraordinary yeah. stuff. And then the other tranche, there were four more that were released uh, on uh, Thursday last week, including more galaxies, a group of galaxies which have been, I think they've regarded very fondly by astronomers and have been known for, for many years. It's called Stefan's Quintet, and it's five galaxies of which some are actually interacting. 
But what is staggering about the... I think they're about 200 million light years away, if I remember rightly. They're not in the distant universe. They're relatively nearby. But what staggered me about that image is that um, you can actually see individual stars in some of these galaxies. So the telescope is sufficiently powerful and has enough resolution that it is actually depicting these individual stars within that object, which is really quite astonishing. It looks like a jellyfish. (laughs) Yeah, one of them does, that's right. Uh, Mm. But the the spotted jellyfish with all the the stars in it. And then uh, two images of very famous objects representing opposite ends of uh, of a star's life. There's a lovely planetary nebula, sometimes called the the Southern Ring Nebula, which is the shell of gas and dust that's been emitted by a star when it gets to the end of its life. In fact, a sunlight star. So this is something our sun will do in three or four billion years' time, maybe a little bit longer than that. It will form a shell around it, and it will be known as, to any <laughs> any body observing it from the outside who speaks English, it will be known as as a planetary nebula, because that's the name that uh, William Herschel gave to these things back in the 1800s. Because they looked a bit like planets, nothing to do with planets, but uh, yeah. that's what they looked they like. Look like. They look kind of opal-like. Yes, they do, yeah. Mm. I always noticed that as well. And that's, to some extent, the colours in them, which, of course, the, the web puts in because it's sensitive to different wavelengths of infrared radiation. And then yeah. at the end of a star's life, the Eta Carina Nebula, a stunning image of the edge of the, of the dust shell, which is formed by hot young stars within a cloud of dust blasting out ultraviolet radiation, which is piling up the dusty material to give you this edge, which looks like, well, cliffs or mountains, depending on which way you you look at it. But it is an absolutely staggering image. Um, It is really amazing. And, and yeah, people do describe it as a mountain range. And as soon as you look at it, you go... Looks like a mountain range, and then <laughs> you at, you know, at night being photographed. Yeah, because night, it's got stars then, in it. <laughs> yeah, but then you then you start realizing, you know, the stars are all over it, and you've got to read the caption to get the the gist of the, the image of what's going on. Yeah, so it it is it's, it's you know material. This is this cavity that's been carved out by the radiation of these young stars, and uh, and what you're seeing is the edge of that cavern cavity. It's a it's a yeah. stunningly pretty beautiful sure image, actually. It is, isn't it? And I'm yeah. pretty sure on the left hand side that's Mount Rushmore, and that looks like George Washington. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's probably there too, yeah. And then the the final one that was issued last week was actually not an image, it was a spectrum. And good on James Webb for doing that because the... Um, you know, what teaches us more about the universe than anything else is the spectrum of objects, the, you know, the, the rainbow colours as the, as the light is broken up, which extends, of course, into the infrared wavelength. We just don't see those colours, but those colours are there. And um, so this spectrum was of a distant exoplanet. If I remember rightly, it's WASP. I can't remember. It was 97B or 96, 96B. 96B, yeah. WASP 96B, a hot Jupiter orbiting very close to its parent star. But what the spectrum shows quite definitively is that it has water vapour in its atmosphere. So it's uh, now being described as a steamy hot Jupiter. And talking of Jupiter, (laughs) the one thing... Yes, indeed. The one thing that... Nice segue, uh, Fred. Oh, not bad, eh? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Once in a while I can do those, but not very often. (laughs) It's only taken him six years. Six years, yes, that's right. um, I think I might have commented... I can't remember who it was to. It might have been you. I was surprised that there weren't any solar system objects in that in that first tranche yeah. of, uh, of data. Now, you didn't say that to me, but I, I am surprised too. Yeah. And, uh, well, they've made up for it because we've now got this yes. extraordinary image of Jupiter, which shows... Uh, it's a slightly anemic looking image, but it is. And, the, and the great red spot is kind of overexposed, uh, kind of white in colour, presumably because it's it's so bright in that frequency. I think it was two point two microns, if I remember rightly, that this wavelength this was taken, which is the mid infrared. Sorry, that it, it's the middle band of the near infrared is is where it is. Mm. So not far beyond the red end of the of the spectrum. But what I noticed was just how much detail there is in the cloud belts. And it's when you see those swirling vortices that are shown up in the cloud belts, it's very reminiscent of what we've seen from the Juno spacecraft. 
which yeah. is you know in orbit right next door to to Jupiter. So I think we're going to see some very dramatic stuff coming from the James Webb Telescope in the solar system. And the image Indeed. I'm looking at too actually captures, I think it's Europa. It is uh, which, Europa. Which uh, has got a black dot in it, which I think has been put on just to occult the uh, disk of Europa from stop it from sending too much infrared radiation back. And you can also see Europa's shadow on the on the planet's cloud belts as well. A very, right very near nice. the black and night, right near the red spot. Right near actually. the red spot. That's right. That's so it, yeah, yeah. You know, these are fantastic tasters to what the web is going to be able to achieve, and uh, yeah. uh, all all credit to the whole team for getting it all together. Absolutely. Early days yet, but what a great start yes, to um, exactly. this, this longitudinal project. Indeed. Um, so, yes, if you want to see those images, they're on the NASA website, but uh, phys.org also has them. Mm. So uh, pop along and, and take a peek. Now, Fred, let's move on to this next story. And I find this fascinating given the current state of affairs in the world, but it looks like uh, American astronauts and Russian cosmonauts will continue to uh, work together on the International Space Station. But we also have another quite incredible piece of information to pass on regarding Roscosmos. And uh, this is sort of hot off the press, isn't it? Yes, I think so. It's, well, let's talk, talk about that first, because we've mentioned this gentleman before. He's featured mm. quite a bit on uh, on our podcast. Dmitry Rogotsin is his name. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Who's been the very pro-Russian, uh, sorry, very pro-Putin head of Roscosmos. He has been moved on, but yeah. it sounds from what we're reading that it's not a demotion. We're not getting the idea that uh, President Putin is unhappy with Dmitry Rogotsin. Uh, and uh, that's, in fact, that comes from uh, a Kremlin spokesman who's basically said that. But there is a rumour in the media suggesting that he might be promoted to be put in charge of the occupied territories in Ukraine, which I suppose fits in with his strong pro-Putin stance. But he's had he's said a lot of things that are not really all that pleasant about um, the International Space Station. One, one of his tweets said, if you block cooperation with us, who will save the ISS from uncontrolled deorbiting and falling on US or European territory? Which is a mm. bit, you know, sort of in your face. Uh, yes. So anyway, we will see what happens. And I'm not sure if we have a name yet. I'm just checking up for... As to who will replace successor. him. ...successor, that's right, because, yeah. uh, you know, that's a is a key role. Okay, yes, he's being replaced by a gentleman by the name of Yuri Borisov. And I don't know anything about Yuri Borisov, but hopefully um, we will find out what his stance will be on these sorts of things. He's hardly likely to be, you know, he's hardly, highly unlikely to be anything other than a Putin sympathiser. But, you know, well, maybe yeah. his stance on... The Space and space cooperation might be a bit different because that's the crucial thing. The International Space Station mm. absolutely depends on cooperation between its five, the five agencies that operate it, which are ESA, Roscosmos, NASA, and is it JAXA, I think, the Japanese Space JAXA, Agency? JAXA, the Japanese and, Space and Agency. And the Canadian yeah. Space Agency, yeah. So yeah. a major cooperation. And that's what the other part of this story is about, that NASA and Roscosmos have actually signed an, a new agreement, which has been in the offing for a long time, to integrate their flights to the International Space Station. So basically, Russian cosmonauts fly on... Um, you know, Crew Dragon or any other US-made spacecraft that are introduced, and American astronauts fly on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. So it's a deal that's been done in the face of probably some, well, certainly a pretty difficult time. Um, mm. We do know that the cosmonauts and the astronauts themselves have formed very strong relationships, and I think they're working well together on all fronts. It's... Well, but, <laughs> Yeah, but I don't suppose you have much choice. You've got but no to choice. Put the politics right. aside, exactly. And yeah. let's face it: the people up there that are doing all that work on the International Space Station probably have very little to do with what's going on in Ukraine. In fact, I think the vast majority of Russian people are probably in that boat. I think you're right. I think that's right. Sadly, yes, yes, indeed. But 
Maybe it's not a coincidence that these two announcements came at the same time because one will soften the blow involving the other, I imagine. Yeah, maybe. Yes, that's right. I mean, I mean yes. Well, certainly good news that uh, that we've got this cooperation, you know, this deal signed between the two space agencies. And yeah. maybe it's good news that... Uh, Dr. Rogotin is no longer running. <laughs> Who Maybe. knows? Yeah, we we just don't know. Out, we simply don't he's know. He's been a bit out there, a bit outrageous, yeah. and yeah. a bit out of his depths sometimes, I would Maybe. think. But, Maybe uh, that's right. Yeah. So he's got a new gig. Um, if I remember rightly, a lot of the Russian launches come out of Ukraine, don't they? No, it's Kazakhstan. They have a space? Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I knew it was. Baikonur. Somewhere that's around right. there. Yeah. They're launching enough in Ukraine anyway at the moment. Well, that's right. It's a different kind of rocket, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, indeed. But, uh, yeah, we'll watch with interest. But that it's good to see that that relationship seems to be fairly strong, at least in terms of uh, the International Space Station and the deals there. Mm-hmm. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Let's take a break from the show to talk about our sponsor, Nord VPN. Now, Nord... VPN provides you with online security. You can cover up to six devices with the one account, and that includes your smart TV, your router, your smartphone, your tablet, your laptop, or your desktop computer. You might have a combination of those things. Uh, This is a, a great plan. And Nord is the best in the business. They've been doing this for a very long time. They also have the fastest servers. And sometimes you can get faster speeds by connecting to NordVPN than you get when you connect to your um, your, your internet service provider. Now, um, there is a special deal for you as a Space Nuts listener, which I'll get to in a moment. But uh, there are there are different plans. You can go a two-year plan, a one-year plan, or a monthly plan. Uh, within those, there are different levels of um, uh, service. Now, let's just take a look at the two-year plan because it's obviously going to be the least expensive. And if you go for the complete package, you get uh, secure high-speed VPN, malware protection, tracker and ad blocker protection, cross-platform password management, uh, data breach scanning, and one terabyte of encrypted cloud storage. So that's the ant's pants as far as uh, a combination deal is concerned. And you can get it at a very, very low price, including one month free. And don't forget, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee with NordVPN. So the URL you need to go to is nordvpn.com slash space nuts. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts. Click on the grab the deal button and go from there and choose your options. But uh, I would certainly suggest the complete package over two years gives you the best bang for your buck. But uh, whatever you choose, you're going to get a great deal from NordVPN. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts and use the code space nuts uh, when you sign up for NordVPN, our wonderful sponsors. Now, back to the show. Roger, your lives are here also. Space Nuts. Back to the red planet, Fred. Mars. It's in the news a heck of a lot. Not as much as James Webb has been of late, but there's a lot of exciting things happening on Mars. This is completely different. This has nothing to do with sailplanes or helicopters or rovers. This has got everything to do with a hole in the ground or a crater that um, sent out a significant piece of rock. So tell us what's going on here. Yeah, so Martian meteorite, I think... It, the number of known meteorites from Mars is now, I think it's in the hundreds. I remember writing about it more than a decade ago, and it was about 30, but I think it's well above that. It might even be 200 or so. How do we know they come from Mars? Because the, they contain little pockets of air in them, which match Mars's atmosphere exactly. Uh, and so one of them in particular, which uh, has, a, has a technical name, but is usually called the Black Beauty, it's mm. um, it's one that was found actually back in 2011 uh, in northern Africa, and you know that that region is one of the places where meteorites are commonly found there in Antarctica because you've got you've got sandy deserts in northern Africa, you've got snowy deserts in Antarctica, and black meteorites show up pretty well in both those you know both those environments. Um, yeah, I've just found a photo of it. It's a stunning. It's rock. lovely, isn't it? And I've found its technical name, mm. which is NWA seven zero three four, but it's usually called Black Beauty because it is such yeah. a beautiful piece of rock, and it's unusual 
because rather than being a chunk of basalt or a chunk of granite or whatever, it is actually what's called breccia. It's um, it's a rock that's made of a an amalgam of many other different kinds of rock. Uh, so it's not just, you know, a, a single rock, a type of rock. It's lots of other stuff, all bits and pieces of other rocks, all kind of bonded together, cemented together. And yeah. I think that's been one of the clues that's allowed scientists, in fact, based at Curtin University here in Australia, and I think they're using the Pawsey Supercomputer, yes, the Super, Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre, which is at, uh, partly uh, operated by Curtin, and actually plays a big part in you know data reduction for the Square Kilometre Array and its precursor telescopes here in mm. Australia. Anyway, these scientists, what they've done is they've said, OK, here's this... Uh, Here's a chunk of rock which contains a bit of a mix of other stuff in it. Can we find where it came from, What, where the impact took place? Because that's how these Martian meteorites leave Mars. They're, they're, they're the result of an impact on Mars's surface. And I think in this case, it was between 4 and 10 million years ago. It's been dated at that sort of level. It's only been on Earth for you know, for 11 years, since 2011. So it probably wandered in space for many millions of years, having been dislodged wow. by an impact on Mars's surface earlier on. Uh, so what these people at Curtin have done is looked at the sort of global uh, images that we've got from various spacecraft where which have mapped the whole of Mars. And the first one is to look at the distribution of craters and i think they've mapped is it 90 million i can't remember i don't have it in front of me wow. uh, 90 million craters a huge huge number of craters um uh, i should check that looking back at a different article which i don't have in front of me at the moment but anyway they've basically identified lots and lots of craters then they've looked at the mars global global surveyor data a NASA spacecraft to get the topography, the, the sort of height of the land, how thick the crust is. That comes from actually all of um, Mars's orbiting spacecraft in Mars or former orbiting spacecraft, Mars Re Reconnaissance Orbiter, still going strong, Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey. I think those two are going strong anymore. I'm not sure about that. But they've, they've got crustal thickness data, and that, that comes from... Um, gravity measurements, basically. Then they've looked at the magnetism, looking for magnetic anomalies on Mars. And that comes from the MAVEN spacecraft on MARVEN, which is partly there to sense Mars, Mars's atmosphere, but also looks for magnetism. And then finally, from Mars Odyssey, they've maps of the thorium and potassium abundance, in other words, some chemical abundances on Mars. And so what they've done is all these different uh, different sort of maps of Mars have been combined together in an AI program where what they've done is sifted through all this, the artificial intelligence system, and looked for craters that, that would have been formed in a way that would have generated the black beauty with its brecciated uh -huh. structure. And sure enough, they found one, <laughs> which is fantastic, which I think they're giving a name, actually. I think it's going to get... An Australian uh, name Caratha is it Caratha Crater? Crater? That's right, Caratha Crater. Yep. Yeah. So it is a fantastic story. You know, guess what it does is demonstrates, and I've just confirmed. Yes, it is ninety million craters that they mapped. What it does is demonstrate wow. the power of supercomputers in terms of doing this kind of science. And yeah, I think it's a fabulous outcome. And all credit to the uh, the team at Curtin University. I think it's remarkable that you can find a rock that's like that big, big as your fist or some, something like that, and have the technology to go, okay, we found that rock there, but it came from there all those millions and millions of kilometres away. Yes, it's and, remarkable. and millions and millions of, of years ago. Years. Uh, so yeah. it is. It's it, yeah, remarkable. It prompts a question, though. We are finding rocks all over the place from Mars that have obviously been ejected due to a high impact event on the Martian surface and sent out into space, float around for a couple of billion years and then <laughs> get caught in our gravity and sucked into, uh, into our atmosphere and end up wherever they end up and we find them. Um, do we know of any other rocks from any other objects? I assume the moon, there'd be a few, but um, what about Venus? What about Mercury? 
I uh, would. Yeah, that, would we have any of that's those? That's a great on our question. Planet? There are certainly many lunar meteorites. I think that they outnumber the Martian ones. Do you know? I don't know the answer to that. I think oh. it is probably no, because you don't really okay. hear about them. Because they're inside the. It might be yes, um, just, just the because they're you know they I guess uh, as they wander around in space, they're more likely to be pulled in towards the sun rather than you know, drifting. So is it possible then that uh, pieces of the Earth are on ah, Venus and Mercury? That's a lovely thought. Yes, I guess you're probably mm. right, Andrew. That's some great, la- great lateral a... thinking there. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of Mars on Earth. So <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> I wonder if every... Yeah. There's probably pieces of Mars on... on, on, um, on the... Venus, yeah, there might well perhaps. be. I mean, Venus is, you know... It's hard to imagine us ever going looking for Earth meteorites on Venus just because no. it's doing anything on Venus is such a such a high risk and difficult venture. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's just such a hostile environment. Mm. It's uh, yeah, I saw someone the other day um who shall remain nameless who flies for British Airways and is a very big follower of the show, uh, whinging about 21 degrees in her greenhouse in England the other day. <laughs> um, in- England is Venus-like yes, at the moment is. with temperatures up around oh, 40 yeah, during the day. 40, so. that's right, yeah. Yeah, they know what it's like. Yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't have to come here now to understand what it's like here sometimes. <laughs> that's correct. They don't have to worry about that. Hi, Hannah. <laughs> uh, but, yes, it is it is fascinating that all, that we swap all this stuff. I mean... When I was growing up, no one ever thought about no, that kind of thing. No, that's right. And we just we just knew rocks hit us, and we just yeah. didn't know much about yeah. them. I'm sure. You, yeah. yeah, but I, uh, now we can identify the exact spot that they've come yeah. from. In some, I respects. mean, certainly as far as Mars meteorites are concerned, it's only been uh, since 1976 that we could have recognised them because that's when the Martian atmosphere was first measured by the Viking Mm. spacecraft. They actually analysed the atmosphere of Mars. And it's since then that we've been able to say, oh, this has got pockets of Mars air in it. So so we know it's from Mars. Of course, before that, you couldn't have done. Absolutely, yes. But um, yeah, it's worth uh, worth looking into that story. And again, uh, fizz.org is where you'll find it if you if you want to read up on it and have a look at that Black Beauty a meteorite that uh, came from Mars. It is an absolute ripper. And while I'm talking about rocks, one of the things we did last weekend in Bathurst, Fred, is we uh, visited the Australian Fossil and Mineral Museum, which hosts the Somerville Collection. Warren Somerville has been collecting amazing minerals for his entire life and donated much of his collection to the museum in Bathurst. And you go through there and and you can just learn so much about all the minerals Mm. that uh, exist on Earth and how we use them. I mean, they have little um, little cabinets with all these different types of, uh, I don't know, let's think of calcite, for example. Mm. And on the bottom, it'll show you what we use calcite for and and all sorts of other things. It's fascinating, and then right out the back, the the um, the go to object is the full scale, one hundred percent intact, fossilized skeleton of a T Rex. Oh, <laughs> it is. Oh yeah. Wow. It is amazing. I bet it is. Yeah. yeah. My grandson was so enthralled yeah, by that. It scared that. him actually because it is. <laughs> it is humongous. Yeah. They weren't small. Yeah. Uh, and the, there's a smaller one next to it now. I think it's an Albertosaurus from Canada. Mm-hmm. That's what it's called, an Albertosaurus, but it, it's a big meat eater as well. So, yeah, very. If you ever get to Bathurst, you've got to do the museum, see the Australian Fossil Museum because it's fantastic. That's by the by, but we were talking about rocks, so I thought <laughs> I'd throw it one. in there. Oh, it's a good one. Yeah, this is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Now it's time to let you quiz us, or more specifically, Fred, with questions from the audience for another edition of Space Nuts. And I did mention Albertosaurus in the previous segment, and just so happens that uh, our first question comes from Canada. Salut, Fred and Andrew. I'm Mark from uh, Sherbrooke in Quebec. Now here's a question I really cannot get around in my mind. Um, and uh, Andrew, you like what if questions, so uh, here's one. Now, what would happen if a black hole that has the exact same mass as the Earth would touch our planet? Um, well, first, what 
would we see and for how long and uh, what would happen to the black hole uh, and what would happen if a black hole that would be just slightly less massive than the earth um, would touch our planet so uh, thank you for um, uh, listening to my question and uh, thanks again for this absolutely amazing show guys um, so sending lots of love from Quebec bye bye merci Oh, lovely. Love the accent. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thanks for the, the endorsement. That's uh, that's terrific. Yeah, if a black hole touched Earth, I don't think we'd be around to see that, to be honest, but we might see something in the time leading up to the event. We might. Would that yes, be fair to say? Right. We might. <laughs> We'd certainly see ourselves stretch out into long strings of spaghetti, that's I right. imagine. That's the, the bottom line there, Andrew. It's um, So uh, we... I mean, what happens when you've got black holes of equal mass is they spiral around one another, kind of their orbits around it, their common centre of gravity getting smaller and smaller until they finally co coalesce and form a, a black hole, which is not quite the sum of their masses because some of that mass is radiated away, is lost and radiated, radiated away as gravitational waves. And I think something similar to that would happen. So if a black hole wandered near the Earth, started approaching, uh, then it would become gravitationally the, uh, the the main thing pulling the Earth. And the two, no doubt they would continue orbiting the Sun, but the two would orbit one another in ever decreasing circles. Uh, and as the black hole got nearer and nearer, the Earth, its structure would not be able to withstand the gravitational gradient, which is the critical thing, how by how much the gravity is changing. And that's what gives rise to tides on the Earth. So it happens with the Moon. The Moon pulls one side more than the other, and we get forgetification of the ocean, if I can put it that way. But with a black hole, yeah. uh, with a black hole, it's it's much more acute. And so yes, the rocks start getting pulled apart and would not be a good outcome. Yeah. Regarding what we'd see is interesting because if I remember rightly, the event horizon diameter of an Earth mass black hole, I think the figure is 18 millimetres. So you're talking about a black blob 18 millimetres in diameter, but of course it might be oh. surrounded by an accretion disk. Well, it would be because the bits of the Earth would make an accretion disk around it. But yeah, it would be, it would be yeah. curtains for, for the Earth, I think is the answer to that. Are there black holes that small? We don't know. Um, the you know the Hawking theory was that um, Earth mass black holes were created in the Big Bang, and um, mm. in fact, uh, you know, the suggestion is that various sizes of black holes might have been created in the Big Bang, but these are, they're called what are called primordial black holes, and it, one is still a fairly active theory that there are many mm. sort of. Planetary mass, you might call it, black holes, which are primordial, which originated in the Big Bang, lurking around in the universe. But we haven't really got very much evidence of them yet, so it's still a theory. Well, if, if one ever turned up, yeah, we would evidence yeah. of it pretty yeah. quickly, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> be fairly compelling and final yeah. evidence, would that, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. There's this book that I, um, I'm aware of that has micro black holes okay. in it which I thought was a great yes. idea at the time. So that was, that was in Parallax. It's your Parallax so book, that, yeah. That sort of, <laughs> yeah, that sort of formed the basis of the storyline, micro, micro I black holes. I seem to remember that, mm. yes. Yeah, yeah. So I thought that was just dumb, no, but it no, seems like there, the money, there might yeah. be something to it. <laughs> yeah. So there you are, Mark. It would not be pretty. Mm. It might be pretty to look at, but, you know, it wouldn't be pretty for Earth or its inhabitants or anything else for that matter. We'd just become a big pile of junk spinning around a um We'd be, a well, black hole. then in, in the black hole, which is, yeah, yeah. And then in, yes. All right, thanks, Mark. Great to hear from you. Let's go to Western Australia. And Rusty's got a really good question. Hey, Fred and Andrew. It's Rusty in Donnybrook. In the last show, you talked about quasars, and I'm wondering, um, are quasars... Uh, bright in all directions, or are they only bright in the directions of the poles of the black hole? 
And if that's true, uh, there would have to be many more quasars out there than we can actually see. What are the chances there would be some inside a couple of billion light years that we just can't see? Uh, Thanks for what could possibly be the best podcast in the universe. Cheers. (laughs) Cheers. <laughs> Thanks, Rusty. And, and uh, for those listening and watching live, perhaps, there's a distinct theme with question selection here. You've got to say nice things about it, <laughs> um, nice things about us. Otherwise, you don't get on. <laughs> That's not true. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding around. The nice, just kidding around. But thanks, Rusty. The nice thing is that uh, Rusty's one yeah, of our, our regulars. listeners tend to say nice things about us, which is very nice. Uh, yeah, we listen to the ones who don't as well. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do, and quite often uh, we answer them, and you know, we're okay with constructive criticism. <laughs> um, that's fine. Now, quasars. I suppose, yeah, we should just review what a quasar is for those who may have um, not been au fait with them, and then we can build on that. That's right. They were a mystery for for many decades. So it was in the 60s that uh, we first started observing these things. And in fact, the first ones that were observed were observed in radio waves, and they nomenclature issue here because they I think they were the ones that were called quasars as a as a, an abbreviation from QSO which is a quasi stellar object and that really gives you the origin of the name looks like a star because it's a pinpoint of light or radio waves but it's not <laughs> it's not a star it's only a quasi a quasi star uh, and then they were discovered in visible light and it was it was only when uh, you could see the visible light coming from these things that you could recognise that they were a very long way off because they were highly redshifted. The, the, the light of the uh, you know from the individual spectrum elements, which was mostly hydrogen, that was redshifted by quite high levels, and that tells you that you're looking at something a long way away. So, uh, mm. but so that was the sort of observational side back in the '60s. We knew about quasars, but it was only. Uh, probably in the 80s or even 90s, that they were associated with black holes because the idea, the problem with a quasar was that they seemed to be delivering huge amounts of energy, but they had uh, dimensions that were very small. They were solar system sized. Uh, And you get that observation very quickly if you can see them varying in intensity, because if they vary over a short, short enough time scale, you can tell that it can't be bigger than, you know, passage, the light travel time across that, uh, that distance, across a, across a distance. So that, ties them down as being very compact. And that the only yep. thing that could give rise to that amount of energy coming from something that compact was the accretion disk around a black hole, the material swirling around it and being excited to extremely high energies and d- delivering that energy as radiation. So that's what we are. They, they are in the centres of galaxies. And that was only realised fairly late in the day when people good enough images to realise that these quasars had galaxies around them. They're usually called the host galaxy. And now we associate the quasars with activity around the supermassive black hole at the centre of those galaxies. And now Rusty's question is is on the money because he mentioned whether there might be quasars within, say, 2 billion light years. And it's only around that distance that you start to see them, which is telling you that in today's universe, they are, if not extinct, they're very rare. There is one, I think, that's about 700 million light years away. I think it's a bit of a rarity, though. So generally speaking, you don't find quasars in today's universe because they seem to have, you know, that basically they've run out of the fuel that was supercharging them to, to be energetic. Now, the nub of Rusty's question is, do you only see them when you're looking down the, the jets of material that, that basically emitted at right angles to the accretion disk? And that's what we used to think, that we only saw them, <coughs> excuse me, when they were spotlighting the Earth. <clears throat> because the Earth happened to happen, mm. happened to be in the the beam of one of these things, but I think now the consensus is the accretion disk itself is so bright uh, because it delivers so much energy 
that you can actually, that's what you can see. And so they emit their light in all directions, which is actually what Rusty's question was. <laughs> ah, okay. So we could have just said yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd, you know, say say yes, slightly embellished with, you know, a bit of background <laughs> what a quasar is, raking back through my memory. Of, yeah. <laughs> Well, I did ask you to you do did, that. You did, yeah. Didn't I? yeah. No, that's all right. Anyway, it's yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rusty. It's yes. It's yes, Rusty. <laughs> Very astute as always, yeah, though, is Rusty. Good question. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Rusty. Hope all is well in Donnybrook, WA. Uh, that brings us to the end, Fred. But I do want to remind people if they want to send us questions, please do so via our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. And there's a couple of ways you can do it. The AMA tab is where you can send us text or audio questions or the little tab on the right-hand side of the screen that says send us your audio question. Uh, you can press that. As long as you've got a device with a microphone in it, you can record a question. Don't forget to tell us who you are. And while you're visiting the website, check out the shop because there's lots of stuff in the shop. Fred's latest book is in there as well. Don't forget social media. We're on uh, Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on that other thing, <laughs> that I, TikTok. And we're on Facebook as an official page, but we also have the user-generated page, the Space Nuts podcast group. So whatever takes your fancy, don't forget to, to uh, visit. And send us your reviews. Well, don't send them to us. Send them to your podcast distributor. If you're listening on iTunes, you can do a review. If you're listening on Spotify, you can do a review. Um, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to us, you can do a review and more reviews, more people get the message that we're out there. That's more listeners. That's more people who are hearing uh, what Fred has to say about what's happening in astronomy and space science, basically. But, yes, that is the end. Thank you, Fred, for your company this week, as always. Much uh, appreciated. I appreciate it, too, the, the fact that you changed the schedule around to suit my comings and goings. I appreciate that very much. And thank you, Andrew. Always great to chat. It's a big advantage being retired <laughs> when, when last-minute changes happen. Yeah, no Shit. problem. <laughs> I wasn't doing anything. Yeah, it's all good. Thanks, See Fred. You See you soon. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here at Space Nuts, and thanks to Hugh in the studio who had to dash home last minute to um, put this all together and get us out there live for the recording session. Um, he'll have to run back to the track and see if his horse is won <laughs> later. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. As always, looking forward to catching up with you again on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.